Starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on employer tax compliance top tips. I'm Charmaine Puffett, and I'm joined by my colleague Charlotte Hobra. And the aim of this webinar is to help you to meet your compliance deadlines for the 2018-19 tax year and provide you with some general guidance going forward. So we're going to start with uh, an overview of P11D general compliance, which is very topical at the moment with the deadline looming. Uh, Payers you earn settlement agreements, the business expense exemption, formerly known as dispensations, pay rolling of benefits in kind, both informal and formal, optional remuneration, uh, also known as salary sacrifice, changes to company car and van taxes, trivial and other useful tax-free benefits, auto-enrolment for pensions, auto-enrolment for foreign companies, and online share reporting. Charlotte will begin by talking to you about P11D reporting. Thank you, Charmaine. So, P11Ds. Once the tax year is finished, employers will need to submit a P11D form for each individual that they have provided benefits to. This is a form that reports all the benefits that have been provided to an employee and may include items like, for example, medical insurance and company cars. It's important to note that P11D does not need to be submitted for an employee if they're paying tax on their benefits through the payroll, which is called payroll of benefits. So the number of P11Ds needed may decrease if an employer has started to payroll benefits. Charmaine will be talking more about payrolling benefits later in this webinar. The employer will also need to submit a P11DB form if they've submitted any P11D forms or if they are payrolling benefits. This means that an employer may still need to submit a P11DB even if they're not actually submitting any P11D forms. The reason a P11DB form is still needed is because it tells you how much Class 1A national insurance you need to pay on the benefits. The amount reported on the P11D for each benefit may be calculated differently. It won't necessarily be the amount that it's actually cost you as an employer. It's therefore important to seek professional advice or read the HMRC benefits manual carefully. There are various different ways of submitting the P11Ds to HMRC, varying from the use of commercial payroll software to actually downloading the forms and sending to the P11D support team at HMRC. P11D and P11DB forms can be amended if there are any errors or omissions made. The amended P11D form must include all benefits originally reported plus the amendment or omission, not just the new item being reported. And it also must be submitted on paper, that's even if the original was submitted online. A change from 6th of April 16 is that a dispensation is no longer needed to omit business expenses paid to employees, as these were replaced by an automatic exemption. The deadline for submission of the forms is 6th of July following the tax year. So for example, 6th of July 2019 for the 1819 tax year. And please note, penalties will be levied for late submission. I'm now going to hand over to Charmaine, who's going to talk about PAYE settlement agreements. Right, pension and settlement agreements, also known as PSAs, We've actually had these for quite a number of years and they're very useful if you want to reward your staff but you don't actually want them to suffer any tax or national insurance on the benefit. Instead, the employer makes one annual payment to cover all of the tax and NIC due. A PSA can't be used for benefits that have their own charging provisions, that's things like cars and vans. Um, but there are basic conditions that uh, you can only include benefits that are minor irregular or that it's impractical to operate pay as you earn on. The most common uh, benefits that we see in PSAs are things like uh, employee entertainment, uh, reward schemes and non-cash vouchers. But there's a whole number of things that would be uh, that would actually meet the criteria and be able to be included. For benefits that would otherwise attract class one employee and employer national insurance through the payroll, and I will come back to this later on how you can, you can tell if they do, the pay, PSA must be put in place before the benefit is actually provided to the employees. The reason for that is because when class one primary and secondary NI is due, it has to be accounted for in real time through the payroll. So if you apply for the PSA after it's been payrolled, too much national insurance will have been paid. 
For any other benefits, you've got until the 6th of July after the end of the tax year in which the benefit was actually provided to staff to, to put the agreement in place. So you used to have to put a PSA in place by signing a formal agreement every year. HMRC have now centralised the whole process and so from the 2018-19 tax year onwards, once you've got one in place, it will just continue until either you or HMRC choose to cancel it. It can also be amended at any time and you can add or remove benefits. The amount of tax and national insurance depends on the marginal rates of tax that each employee provided with those benefits actually pays and the tax is worked out on a grossed up basis. There's no employee airline, so there's a saving there. Um, so the net cost, including the VAT, is grossed up for tax and the employer pays class 1B national insurance on the gross benefit at a rate of 13.8%. Don't forget that uh, there are different rates for Scottish taxpayer and a Scottish taxpayer is defined by where the employee actually has his main residence and not where he works. So he could have his main home up in Scotland but work locally in London um, and he would still have to pay Scottish rates. So make sure that you take that into consideration. Uh, the company will of course be able to claim corporation tax relief for the tax and national insurance, just as it would for any other form of employee remuneration. The tax and national insurance calculation has to be submitted to HMRC by the 31st of July, following the end of the tax year. And then you make the payment to HMRC by the 19th of October, or the 22nd if you pay electronically. HMRC will actually give you payment instructions, um, and the payment shouldn't be made as part of your, of your normal PAY remittance for that month. And now Charlotte will talk about exemptions. So some routine employee expenses don't actually need to be reported to HMRC and these are called expense exemptions. Exemptions have replaced dispensations so you can't actually apply for a dispensation anymore. The following business expenses and benefits do not therefore need to be reported. These are business travel, phone bills, business entertainment expenses and uniform and tools for work. To qualify for an exemption, you must either pay back the employee's actual costs or pay a flat rate to your employer as part of their earnings. The flat rate must either be a benchmark rate or a special bespoke rate that has been agreed with HMRC already. If you're paying benchmark rates and you don't need to apply for an exemption, however, you must make an application if you want to pay the bespoke rates and you will need to give HMRC evidence that the rates you are suggesting are actually based on employees' actual expenses. You can only use bespoke rates for up to five years from the date they were, they were agreed, so you will need to do a new application every five years. From 6th of April 19, if benchmark sale rates are claimed, employers will only have to ensure that employees evidence that they are on a qualifying business journey, but no receipted evidence of actual expenditure on food and drink purchase during the journey is required. However, if you're using bespoke rates, you will have to continue carrying out random sample checks of receipts. I'm going to pass back to Charmaine now, who's going to talk about payrolling benefits. Right, payrolling benefits, also known as PBIK. This is an alternative way of taxing benefits in kind. So rather than submitting P11Ds for your employees and having their benefits taxed through their tax code number or after the end of the tax year, um, what you do is you tax a proportion of their benefits at each of their pay dates. So if you've got a car benefit, you would divide the car benefit by 12 and tax it one half each month. Now, this approach uh, cuts down on administration and potentially it means that you don't have to complete P11Ds anymore. HMRC like it because it means that they, uh, they get their money earlier through RTI rather than having to wait until an employee completes a tax return or until they issue a P800 tax calculation. Um, now there are certain things that you're not able to payroll and those are shown on the slides. So that's living accommodation and interest free and low interest loans. That includes uh, director's loan, overdrawn loan accounts. So there are certain practicalities around payrolling. 
Uh, firstly, you have to actually register via the government gateway, and you need to do this before the start of the tax year. So if you don't do it, uh, if you haven't done it by the 6th of April 2019, you're already too late to pay all your benefits for the 1920 tax year. So if you do want to pay all benefits in the future, you need to be thinking about the 2021 tax year and get your application in by the 5th of April 2020. There are, there's a link to the uh, web page uh, where you can do that on the slide. Communication with your employees is key. They must be made aware that you are payrolling benefits. When you payroll the benefits, you will show the payroll benefit as a different pay component on their pay slip so that they can see what has been payrolled. You have until the 1st of June um, to let them know what benefits have been payrolled and what the cash equivalent or benefit in kind is on those benefits. Um, you don't have to payroll all benefits. There can be some benefits that you choose not to for one reason or another, and you will still need to declare those non-payroll benefits on P11Ds and provide your employees with a copy of their P11D by the 6th of Jul July after the end of the tax year. Um, new employees, make sure that you let them know what's being included in payrolling. This is to make sure that uh, employees can check their tax code numbers and ensure that benefits aren't also included in their tax codes. Otherwise, they could end up paying tax on the same benefit twice. When you payroll company cars, you don't submit a P46 car. The P46 car is the trigger for HMRC to actually include a car benefit in the tax code. So you don't want to be payrolling and have a car benefit in the code because that's a double whammy for the uh, employee. Um, right, now HMRC do like payrolling because it means that they get everything in real time and it is likely that at some point in the future they will insist that all benefits are payrolled. At the moment it's optional. You can also informally payroll benefits. That's where you just choose to do it without making an application. If you do that, you still have to submit P11Ds for the employees. So I, I don't really see, see much point in doing that. After the end of the tax year, you still must complete a P11DB and include the benefits that have been payrolled on the P11D for Class 1A national insurance purposes and pay the national insurance over to HMRC by the 22nd of July following the end of the tax year. If you've made an agreement with an employee to make good the cost of any benefit, and for one reason or another your employee hasn't made good the cost by their last pay date, they have until the 1st of June to do so. If they still haven't made good, what you do, you still pay your national insurance, by the due date, but you work out the tax that they should have paid and then you payroll that in the following tax year on top of any other payroll benefits that they might have. So now we're going to go on to uh, another subject, to payroll or not to payroll. Now this, I find that uh, many clients are confused over when they should automatically payroll benefits for NI or for both NI and tax. Now, in order to determine the correct treatment for NI purposes, you have to consider who's actually responsible for payment of the invoice. So if the contract is between the employer and the provider, the benefit is subject to Class 1A national insurance. But if it's between the employee and the provider, then it will be Class 1 primary and secondary NI that is uh, employee and employer, and that should be accounted for via the payroll in the tax month that it's actually paid and submitted to HMRC under real-time information. The tax treatment is slightly different. That depends on how the benefit is actually provided. Where the employer settles the invoice directly, it will be a PL&D benefit. But if the employee pays the invoice personally and then reclaims the cost back from their employer, 
the benefit should be payroll for tax purposes because the employer isn't actually providing the employee with a non-cash benefit. What they're doing is giving the employee money or money's worth. So if we run through a very quick example, um, normal circumstances, uh, private medical insurance, let's say, the employer will contract directly with an insurance provider, set up a group policy, and the employer will pay that uh, the premiums directly. So that would be P11D for the tax or payrolling and Class 1A national insurance via the P11D B. Well, now let's say that uh, we've got an employee, Rob, who starts a new job and he's already got his own private medical insurance and he has paid the premium. So he's correct, um, contracted directly for it and he's, he's paid the money. And the employer agrees to reimburse the cost. So as he's contracted for the policy himself, we know it's going to be class one primary and secondary national insurance. And as he's already paid for the uh, expense himself and the employer is giving him money or money's worth, then it should be payroll for tax as well. So you would account for tax and NI through the payroll in the tax month that the reimbursement takes place. The tax and NI is then added to the PAY PAYE remittance for that tax month and uh, it will be included on the employee's pay slip and on his end of year P60. So there's no other reporting requirements and no P11D would be due. Uh, the third scenario is let's say that Rob still got his own policy, comes up for renewal and his employer agrees to pay the insurer directly on his behalf. So the contract's still between Rob and the provider. So class one employer and employee NI is still has to be accounted for through the payroll in the tax month the premium's paid. But because the employer has now provided a non-cash benefit, uh, you declare the benefit on Rob's P11D for tax purposes. Remember that when you complete the P11D, um, private medical insurance attracts class 1A national insurance. So you have to remember to put an adjustment to reduce the class 1A NI in section 4 box C, uh, box C of the P11DB. Or you can just enter the benefit in say section M other items uh, as in the box that doesn't attract class 1A national insurance. The same treatment is true regardless of what the benefit is. Um, but say, for example, you've got uh, an item that has both business and private use. So let's say a home telephone and Rob can quantify his business calls. Then it's only the private proportion that you would put through the payroll. You wouldn't need to payroll the business calls element because that would be covered by the exemption that Charlotte mentioned earlier. So now we're going to go on to optional remuneration uh, arrangements. So these were introduced from the 6th of April 2017 and uh, it's basically another name for salary sacrifice where the employee has given up some of his cash earnings in exchange for a non-cash benefit in kind. So the employee is taxed on the higher of the benefit in kind calculated in the normal way or the cash equivalent that they have given up. Where the employee has taken the cash, you don't need to consider the optional remuneration rules because he's taken cash and that's what's taxed through payroll. It's only where the employee has actually taken the benefit in kind. So this can end up being quite a bit more expensive for the employee. And so whatever basis you have to use, you do need to make sure that the employee is aware of that. Or if you've got an employee who's decided that they want to change um, from one method to another. So, for instance, somebody with a car allowance might decide that they want a company car instead. Then you need to help your employee and, and help him do the comparison so that he's fully aware of what the tax implications might be because he may still end up paying tax on the cash that he's, he's given up rather than the car benefit that could be lower. So there are some uh, exemptions and those are pension contributions and employer funded pension advice. So where you've got salary sacrifice, um, where your employee's given up some of their wages in exchange for employer pension contributions, those still work. 
as do cycle to work schemes, childcare vouchers, and low emission cars, that is cars with CO2 emissions of less than 75 grams per kilometre. And there were some tra transitional rules that were brought in from 2017. And those were basically that if, uh, if a benefit was already being provided as at April 2017, as long as there was no change, uh, the sacrifice would still work up until the 6th of April 18. Um, there are some uh, rules relating to living accommodation, company cars, vans and school fees where unless there's been a change, unless the contract ends, is changed, modified or varied in any way, the salary sacrifice will still work. So the employee will still have the benefit of the tax relief until the, uh, the 6th of April 2021. Now that includes changing a company car, let's say. But if the only reason that the company car has been changed is because uh, you had an accident and it's been written off, then you wouldn't count that as a change and the salary sacrifice could continue in those circumstances. Right, so um, Charlotte will now talk about car and van changes. Thank you. So there have been some car and van changes uh, from the 6th of April 19 the optional remuneration rules that Charmaine has just talked about have removed now the opportunity for employers to apportion the car allowance otherwise available to company cars across the car insurance and maintenance costs. So what this actually means is, is that from April 19 the rules will change and the employee will be subject to tax on the hire of the amount of salary foregone in relation to the car including the amount of salary foregone for any related benefits such as servicing or insurance which previously you were able to exclude or the car benefit charge calculated in the normal way. Whilst this is going to simplify the calculation, it may well result in more employees experiencing an increase in the car benefit, and therefore it would be advisable for employers to communicate this with affected employees. From the 6th of April 19, the percentage charge for calculating a car benefit rises by 3% at all CO2 levels, although the maximum will remain 37% of list price. This will apply for cars with CO2 emissions of 165 grams per kilometre or more for 2019-20. Remember, for diesel cars, the 4% supplementary charge applies, subject to the overall 37% maximum charge. But a diesel car may be exempt if it meets the Euro standard 6D. The certificate of conformity, which is available from the manufacturer, will confirm whether the car is RDE2, also known as Euro 6D, compliant. This basically means that the diesel su supplement must not be applied when calculating the car benefit and the car fuel benefit charge for diesel cars which are compliant with this Euro 16. HMRC have said that it's not expected there'll be any cars on the market that meet RDE2 standard prior to 1920, but there may be a few. Well, we've actually seen some for 1819, so it's definitely worth checking. However, it is important to know that a car won't meet the standard if it's first registered on the basis of an EC certificate of conformity which indicates level Euro 60 10 and therefore do get vehicle information from the DVLA site. The government is retaining the diesel supplement until 2021 when EU-wide testing procedures will ensure that new diesel cars meet air quality standards under the strict real-world driving conditions. Don't forget as well that the supplement only applies to pure diesel cars and not hybrids. Also, for cars that conform, the fuel indicator letter to be used on the P11D is A rather than D. And A means all other cars, and that does include diesel cars certified to the RDE2 standard. For the next slide, I'm just going to talk about a few other changes to note from the 6th of April 19. Before the 6th of April 19, contributions to life assurance policies and qualifying recognised overseas pension schemes, also known as QROPs, uh, made by employers were not a taxable benefit in kind where the beneficiary was the employee or certain members of the employee's family or household. 
Where the beneficiary was not within this definition, in other words, not a member of the family or household or the employee, the amount was treated as a benefit in kind subject to tax in an IC. However, from the 6th of April 19, the tax exemption has been widened so that the provision of death or retirement benefits will not be taxable as long as the beneficiary is either any individual, so it doesn't have to be a family member anymore, or a registered charity. Also, to note, the minimum wage has increased, as has the student loan thresholds. But please note that the rate of deduction for student loans does remain at 9%. Something else to note is that from the 6th of April 19, all workers will have a statutory entitlement to an itemised payslip. Before the 6th of April 19, this only applied to individuals defined as employees under the Employment Rights Act 1996. I'm going to hand back to Charmaine now, who's going to talk about trivial and other tax-free benefits. Right, I thought I would just recap on a few useful tax exemptions that do still exist. So if we start with the trivial benefit exemption, this was introduced from the 6th of April 2016, and prior to that date, there was no statutory limit. So it's actually up to employers and HMRC tax officers to use what they called a common sense approach based on HMRC guidance to decide if something was trivial or not. So, for example, a bottle of wine could be considered as trivial, even though you could get a very expensive bottle of wine, uh, but a whole case of wine would not be considered trivial and so it would be taxed. Now we've got legislation that actually states uh, when a benefit uh, is exempt under the trivial benefits rules um, and certain conditions have to be met. So each item must not exceed £50. If it does exceed £50, so say, for instance, you sent somebody a bouquet for um, the birth of a child and it was £60, then the whole amount would be taxable. The benefit cannot be in cash. It has to be something that is non-cash. And uh, the employee cannot be entitled to the benefit as part of any contractual obligation and cannot be in recognition of particular services. So if, for instance, uh, you've got a team and they meet their monthly sales target and you decide to take them all out for a lovely meal, unfortunately, that's not going to be covered by the trivial benefits exemption, even if it's under £50 per head, because it's reward or recognition for their employment duties. So. The idea of the exemption was actually uh, to provide employees with uh, welfare benefits and goodwill gestures. Now, as I said before, employees can receive any number of trivial benefits in a tax year. You do have to be careful, though, that the benefits aren't so regular, regular that the employees treat them or consider them as part of their normal remuneration package. For example, you couldn't give somebody um, a £50 um, store voucher every single month um, because they might think that that's just part of their normal remuneration package, so that would be taxable. You also need to be careful because some benefits are what I call connected benefits. So, for instance, uh, you can now get gift cards that are reloadable. So say, for instance, you give an employee a gift card because it's their birthday and you load it up with £50. Uh, and then a few months later, you decide uh, that, you know, you just want to, to give them a treat just out of the generosity of your heart. And you load up another four, £40 onto the, cup, the same card. That means that the total benefit on that item has gone up to £90. So the whole of it would be taxable. So if you're going to give something like vouchers, make sure that you give individual vouchers that can't be topped up. Um, there is a limit for directors and office holders of close companies and their families, and that limit is £300 a year. So now we'll go on to the annual function exemption. Now, there are certain criteria that must be met. Um, as the uh, title suggests, the events must be annual. So they have to be like an annual Christmas party, perhaps an annual barbecue, that type of thing. They have to be open to all staff gen generally. 
but you don't have to have just one event for all staff. So if you've got a number of branches, you could have uh, a Christmas party in each town that you've got a branch. So as long as everybody within the firm has been invited to one function or another, then uh, it can be exempt. And the cost per head must not exceed £150. So that's per head and not per employee. So you could have an employee bring uh, members of their family and you could have people who are not employees and uh, the, the exemption will apply. The £150 must include the total cost of everything. So that's the venue, the food, the drink, entertainment and of course the VAT because uh, VAT is always considered a benefit and you always add back the VAT. You can have more than one event in a tax year. And as long as all events added together don't exceed the £150 limit, then they'll all be exempt. However, if they exceed the £150 limit, then they'll be taxable. So, for example, you could have a Christmas party costing £110 and a summer anniversary ball that costs £40. Both would be tax free because the total is £140. But if the, uh, the summer event was £45, the total would be £155. So the summer ball would be fully taxable and only the Christmas party that comes under the 150 would be tax free. Uh, if you have got, like in the example, an event like that, you could then consider whether perhaps the trivial benefits exemption might apply because the summer party in my example only costing £45 a head, as long as it wasn't a uh, reward in any way for employment duties, then that part could be covered by the £50 a head uh, per item trivial benefits exemption. So it's worth considering that. Uh, now we go on to long service awards. I've recently had a client who um, unfortunately made a few errors and we've had to make a disclosure. So um, number one is that these awards, they can't be in cash. Cash is always taxed through payroll, regardless of, of how much or what for. Uh, the minimum period of service that you can give an, a tax-free award is 20 years and you can't have given the employee a similar award in the previous 10 years, whether that previous award was taxed or not. The award cannot exceed £50 per year of service um, and in the future you could give, uh, you could give one at 20 years and then after 30 years, you could give another award. And again, that would be £50 for all 30 years, not just the, the extra 10 on top of the, the 20 years already done. Uh, mobile phones, they're still a very, uh, a very good perk, but you must make sure that the, uh, the contract for the phone is in the employer's name. You can't just pay your employee's mobile phone bill as uh, that would be taxable and you can only provide one phone per employee. Uh, still an exemption, uh, free parking at or near your workplace. And there's still the option to have childcare vouchers uh, under the uh, childcare voucher scheme, uh, as long as employees were already signed up to it. And that's worth £55 a week tax free to a 20% taxpayer, less if you're higher rate or a 45% taxpayer. But remember, if you opt out of the voucher scheme, and you decide to opt into um, the employer supported childcare scheme, you can't go back to childcare vouchers, even if that's going to be more beneficial for you. For you. And then uh, finally, uh, there's a, a working at home allowance. So if you work from home, uh, there's a, a round sum that your employer can pay you, which is four pounds a week, uh, which you don't need evidence for. And that's to cover the additional cost of working from home. And now I'll pass back to Charlotte. Thanks, Charmaine. So now we're going to look at auto enrolment for pensions, which has been around for a while now, but with re-registration happening for some companies, this is coming back into the spotlight. So under the Pensions Act 2008, every employer in the UK must put certain staff into a pension scheme and also contribute to it for them. This is called automatic enrolment or auto enrolment as it's come to be known. And it does impose legal duties on employers. The legislation affects all employers, even if they only employ one person. However, not all UK businesses are affected as auto enrolment duties don't apply if the company is not actually considered an employer. So for example, a sole director company with no staff would not be considered an employer. 
When the legislation was first introduced, employers fell under the legislation and had to auto-enroll employees at what was called the staging date. Employees could look up their staging date on the pensions regulator website using their PAYE code. But the pensions regulator would also write to all employers 18 and 12 months prior to the staging date. Staging dates no longer exist anymore. And from the 1st of October 17, pension duties start whenever the first employee starts work. An employer can choose to delay auto-enrolment for up to three months for this employee. And this may be useful for short-term staff that don't wish to actually enrol. But they must write to their staff to tell them they're postponing auto-enrolment for them if they do this. And staff whose auto-enrolment has been postponed can then choose to opt in during the postponement period. The criteria for enrolling an employee is that they earn over 10,000 per year, are age 22 or over, and under their state pension date. It also has to be determined whether the employee is ordinarily working in the UK, and we will talk about this in more detail in a minute. This can get quite complicated. If these employees meet the criteria, they must be automatically enrolled in the pension scheme and will then have to opt out within a month of being enrolled if they don't actually want to be a member. It's important to note that employers must not be seen to be encouraging their staff to opt out. So the opt out notice that the employee needs to complete must be provided by the pension scheme, not the employer. Any involvement by the employer can lead to a breach of the law. Once the opt out has been completed, any contributions made since the enrolment are then refunded. Employees that opt out must be re-enrolled on the third anniversary of the staging or pension duties date unless they're about to retire or they have lifetime protection in place. And the employer must, <clears throat> must inform the staff by letter that they have been re-enrolled. <coughs> there are minimum total contribution levels that must be paid under auto-enrolment, and these may be based on qualifying earnings or a different definition of pension or pay. The default earnings that contributions are based on can be the earnings between the National Insurance Lower Earnings Limit of 6,136 and the Upper Earnings Limit of 50,000. You can also base contributions on your own definition of pension or pay, but you must follow certain criteria. So, for example, you may base it on 100% of basic pay or 100% of total pay, including bonuses and overtime, but you will need to decide. From April 19, an employer must contribute a minimum of 3% with a total minimum of 8%. So, for example, the employee therefore has to contribute 5% unless the employer contributes more than 3%. If the employer contributes more than 3%, then the employee has to make up the difference to make a total of 8%. This all can be a complex area and the best approach may be to engage with an independent financial advisor. It's important to note there will be a review of contributions at the end of the year to ensure that the contributions have not been calculated fairly, i.e. contributions based on salary and not bonus, so the bonus is loaded to decrease the contributions needed. There are fines for non-compliance, so it's important to ensure you're meeting your legal obligations, and the obligations are actually under law, so they do need to be complied with. As I briefly mentioned earlier, Re-registration does occur and it must be carried out during the six-month window starting three months before and three months after the third anniversary of the original staging date. So small employers should start receiving notification from the pensions regulators shortly. So this is something to look out for and make sure you do follow out the, the duties that you need to follow. Moving on now to auto-enrolment for foreign companies. So as mentioned above, when we talked about the first slide, an employee does not need to be auto-enrolled if they're not ordinarily working in the UK. The problem with this is it's not often very clear-cut for foreign employers or for UK employers with non-UK employees. And it has been causing quite a lot of confusion for some employers. The pensions regulator guidance advises the employer that to assess ordinarily working, they need to assess a few things. So they need to assess where the worker begins and ends their work, where their private residence is, what currency they're paid in, and where they pay social security. The guidance also states that if an individual is paid through the UK payroll, the auto enrolment duties apply, even if they're short-term, seasonal, or temporary staff. So, generally, if a worker is seconded to the UK, then they are un unlikely to be considered to be ordinarily working in the UK, because they're probably only here on a temporary basis, and in those circumstances, auto-enrolment is probably not required. 
However, if you've got a UK national that's employed by a foreign employer, then they are likely to be considered as ordinary work in the UK, as the UK is their long-term home. Even though they're employed by a foreign employer, they generally live in the UK, and they will therefore need to be auto-enrolled. This second example has caused a lot of confusion for foreign employers, because often that foreign employer will be contributing to a long-standing foreign pension scheme for all their employees, and isn't even aware of the UK auto-enrolment rules. There is often a solution in this case, as overseas pension schemes can sometimes be used as qualifying schemes or for auto-enrolment purposes. EEA and non-EEA pension schemes can be used as qualifying schemes, which means that members can continue to contribute to these schemes under auto-enrolment, rather than contribute to a UK scheme, if that overseas scheme meets certain criteria. However, only EEA schemes can be used for auto-enrolment purposes, so if the employee is not already a member of a non-EEA pension scheme, this cannot be used for auto-enrolment. This often causes difficulties for US individuals who may wish to be auto-enrolled into a US plan. As you can see, this is quite complex and can cause quite a few difficulties. If the foreign employer decides they want to set up a UK pension scheme for the employee because of the difficulties around auto-enrollment and contributing to a foreign scheme, then there may be practical problems as well regarding payment of contributions because often this foreign employer will quite often not have a UK bank account. Most pension providers will only have the option of paying contributions via a UK bank account, so this might cause a problem. We have found a couple of providers that don't require a UK bank account, so there are options out there if the foreign employer can't or doesn't want to set up a UK bank account. The pensions regulator does seem to be aware that this can be complex, as they do state in their guidance that they expect case law to develop over time regarding what the law means by ordinary working. And they have, uh, have advised employers to seek legal advice if they're having difficulties determining whether an employee is ordinarily working in the UK. The problem with this is, though, it's often not particularly helpful, as employers are often up against tight deadlines to comply because they weren't aware of the legislation in the first place, and they often don't have time to seek lengthy legal advice. We are hoping these issues will become clearer in the future as employers test the guidance through practical cases and the pension regulator becomes more used to these instances and perhaps hopefully issues further guidance. If as an employer you don't believe that auto enrolment is required, then we would advise writing to the pensions regulator and explaining the situation and stating the reasons why you don't think it applies and asking for written confirmation of agreement. I think this is better than doing nothing because if nothing is done, then the pensions regulator will probably expect the individual to be auto enrolled automatically and will levy penalties when this isn't done. Moving on now to share schemes reporting. So this was actually a reporting requirement that was spawned originally from P11Ds, because it actually used to be one box on a P11D, but now it's a series of online reports in itself. So first of all, who needs to complete? The reach is actually wide for the requirement to complete this report. So if you have any employee or director that in the course of the tax year has been involved in almost any transaction involving shares or options in the employing company, you probably are going to need to complete an online form. Quite often employers actually don't realise this and are late in completing these forms. So just for the avoidance of doubt, this applies to all of the following share transfers, buying, swelling, buying, selling, swapping, gifting of shares, or generally just messing around with shares. So in, for instance, varying of share rights. It might not be shares also, it might be deri derivatives, options or warrants. Basically, if you can say yes to any of the above, then you do need to do something. The reports are required just like the LMDs for the tax year rather than the accounts period end. So the deadlines for these reports follow the LMDs. So, hence the deadline of before the 6th of July of each year. There are two different online reports. One is for EMI, Enterprise Management Incentives, and one for everything else. EMIs are the most popular form of tax efficient share option scheme, so it may well be that you do need to do some online reporting for EMIs. If it's for EMIs, you need to complete one form, because EMIs have a separate form for everything else. If it's anything else, then you need to complete the other form, which used to be known as a Form 42. There is quite an onerous registration procedure through the Government Gateway, so you do need to allow time for this, probably up to 10 working days. 
You also need to allow time to register for the relevant for potentially further days. So do leave enough time to do this. Once registered, even if you've had no share activity at all in a year, there is still a requirement to complete nil returns. So moving on to the next slide, this just really shows the requirement for the two forms that need to be completed. So you can see that if you've got AMIs, you need to do one form, and for everything else, there'll be a separate registration. So if you've only got AMIs, there'll only be one form you need to complete. But if you've got EMIs and anything else, then you will need to do two forms, one for EMIs and one for everything else. Both have separate registrations, so if you haven't started to register, I suggest that you do this as soon as you can. The key point is that even if you're not doing any, it, even if you're not doing anything that has a value, if you're doing something, you probably still need to note it on the form. So moving on to practical tips. The first thing to be aware of is that there is lots of information required on the form. In fact, there are about 40 or so columns of information, hence why the form 42 name. Information required is, for example, who receives the shares, their NI number, the type of shares, nominal value, and also market value. An important note about market value, the market value can often be overlooked at the time of the transaction. For example, if the shares are just being issued for their nominal value. So you will need to be aware of what the potential market value is. And this is the crux of why HMRC require the information. If the value has been received, if value has been received, then there are potential tax liability issues either for the individual concerned on their tax return or through the PAYE system. The share scheme reporting can also focus the employer's potential on potential tax liabilities for the individual, and maybe you could use a better tax efficient alternative. It's also an area of high focus when a company is sold and is always looked at by the due diligence team, so it's always a good idea to get this up to date and make sure that you have reported all your requirements. As expected, if you're late in filing, just as with PLMDs, there are penalties. These can accrue really quickly as well, as there are daily penalties after a certain period of time has elapsed. So it can be quite a shock for some companies if they don't do anything to find out further on down the line that the penalties are quite high. So the final message really is take action in advance of the 6th of July. It can take time to gather the necessary information, so best to start early. You can either do the registration yourselves or you can use our team of share scheme experts to undertake the work for you. So, to finish off, we're now going to look at whether any questions have come in, as we have been doing um, the webinar. Um, so, um, one of the questions that has come in is, what is the deadline for paying Class 1A NIC? This is by 19th July following the tax year, or the 22nd of July if paid electronically. Uh, right, we've got another question. Uh, my employee uh, receives a monthly car allowance and uses his own car for work, but I'd like him to have a company vehicle instead. Do I need to consider the optional remuneration rules as he will not actually be giving up any salary? And the answer to that is, well, yes, because he is still giving up a cash allowance. And so you will need to consider if the opera rules apply and he will be taxed on the higher of the amount of the cash that he's given up or the benefit in kind for the car using the normal um, calculation rules. Um, another question that's come in relating to vouchers is can I give my employees an MS voucher every month? Um, well, in theory, yes, but as Charmaine mentioned, you must be careful this is not seen as a normal part of the employee's remuneration, so it mustn't be guaranteed in any way. Also, as Charmaine said, you need to be careful as reloadable cards are now very popular and each time you reload the same card, HMRC say this is the same benefit. So you have to add the total for the year. So it would be better to give different gift cards each time. Um, I've got another question. Uh, we operate a perk box scheme. Can we complete a PSA form um, to cover the class one national insurance. Well, if you operate a perk box scheme, uh, the contract effectively is gonna be between the company 
and uh, the provider, so it would be Class 1A national insurance. And yes, because that would be considered as minor, because uh, presumably you only pay a few pounds every month for each employee, uh, it could be included in PSA, and um, many employers do include those types of benefit. So if your perk box started, um, say, in January, and you're paying £8 a month, the period from January to the 5th of April, you will have only paid three uh, amounts for your employees. So that would be, what, £24. So that could be covered by the trivial benefits exemption. But if you're paying £8 a month and you've provided the benefit for a whole tax year, then per employee, that's going to be more than £50 per employee. And so it wouldn't be trivial and you would then need to tax it. So yes, you could very easily put it in a PSA. So that's probably all we've got time for. Thank you very much for listening. Our contact details are on the screen. So if you need to contact us about any further questions, please do. Please also note the next webinar is on Wednesday the 19th of June and that is going to be, obviously that should be 2019, and that's going to be about tax efficient business succession planning. So please do register for that if you're interested in that. Thank you very much. Thank you.